Welcome everyone and thank you for attending the latest in a series of public events by the Michael V. Hayden Center for Intelligence, Policy and International Security. I am Mark Rosell. I serve as the Dean of the Shar School of Policy and Government here at George Mason University. And we are very proud to host the Hayden Center. Tonight, we have about 300 persons signed up from all over the United States and internationally. Participants specifically are from 30 states, the District of Columbia, uh, as well as 18 countries and on five continents, and also from 17 colleges and universities throughout the United States. And we, of course, have a good many students here from George Mason University attending. The Hayden Center, of course, honors its founder, General Michael V. Hayden, who is on the program tonight uh, observing this, and uh, we're very delighted uh, that he's going to be here uh, to watch this program. The Hayden Center is part of a larger security studies emphasis in the Shar School. Our international security studies master's degree program uh, has been a top 10 ranked nationally program for four years running in the US News and World Report rankings. And we are fortunate to have many leading scholars and practitioner teachers in our international security studies master's degree program. Among our practitioner faculty members are two persons who are with us tonight, General Hayden himself, who has been with the Shar School now for 12 years, and our moderator, Michael Morell, who will be co-teaching a class for us in the spring semester, along with Professor Ellen Lapson, who is the director of our security studies degree program. And for interested students, by the way, uh, we have a generous gift from the Diana Davis Spencer Foundation supporting scholarships for Shar School students in security studies field. So if you're thinking about applying to and perhaps enrolling in our programs, uh, please look that up. And now to introduce tonight's special program, I welcome the executive director of the Hayden Center, uh, the former director of the White House Situation Room, Larry Pfeiffer. Larry. Thank you, Mark. Um, very, uh, very excited for tonight's event. Uh, thank you all for taking time to come uh, and uh, participate in our event. As Mark mentioned, the Hayden Center has been here, part of the Shar School at George Mason University for a few years. Uh, Mike Hayden, uh, former director, NSA and CIA, uh, established the center to uh, create a public space where we could put a spotlight on intelligence and the role it plays in supporting the policymaking community. Uh, we do that largely through events with prominent experts like we have tonight. Um, administrative comments uh, briefly, we do have uh, some social media accounts. We'd love for you to follow us on Twitter, uh, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. All our events are being recorded and uh, they are put on our YouTube channel. You just search Hayden Center on YouTube and you can find all the events we've done going back four years. Uh, tonight, we're gonna have time for questions from you in the audience. Uh, I would ask that uh, on Zoom, please use the Q&A tool. Please don't use the chat function to put your questions. Uh, we're gonna be monitoring the Q&A tool for questions and providing those questions to our moderator to uh, ask Chris uh, later in the event. Uh, please keep your questions brief, um, make it a question. If you'd like to be anonymous, there is a little box in the question. When you fill in your question, you can click it to be anonymous. Uh, but if you prefer uh, us to say your name and where you're from, uh, please uh, provide your name and your affiliation, and we'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, very excited uh, for our event tonight. We have as our moderator, Michael Morell. Michael is a uh, former deputy director and twice acting director of CIA. He uh, served 30 plus years in the intel community, has the distinction of being the only person with President Bush on 9-11 and President Obama when Osama bin Laden was taken down. Uh, he is currently a CBS News contributor on national security and intelligence. You will find him on all the CBS platforms. Uh, and he is host for CBS News of the Intelligence Matters podcast. If you've not signed up for that yet, please, once the event is over tonight, go to your podcast source, sign up for Intel Matters. Michael puts on a great, uh, great set of presentations there. He wrote a great book, The Great War of Our Time, The CIA's Fight Against Terrorism from Al-Qaeda to ISIS. He serves as a senior fellow here at the Hayden Center and is, uh, as Mark indicated, a visiting professor here at the Shar School. Tonight, we welcome the nation's uh, first national cyber director, a position created by the National Defense Authorization Act of this last fiscal year. Uh, this position is uh, set up to serve as the principal, principal advisor to the president on cybersecurity policy and strategy, 
and cybersecurity engagement with industry and international stakeholders. I have a feeling the job will be even and is already becoming bigger than that. Uh, we're excited to have Chris Inglis, the first national cybersecurity director, cyber, the national cyber director uh, here tonight, not only because he's in that capacity, but because he's a good friend of ours. Uh, he worked very closely with General Hayden when he was director of NSA. Uh, I worked very closely with Chris uh, at a time when I was uh, overseeing some foreign SIGINT partnerships, and he was uh, uh, the director, the head of a large geographic uh, uh, target. Uh, had great, uh, great memories working with Chris on that. Uh, Chris started out as a U.S. Air Force Academy uh, graduate. He later got advanced degrees from George Washington, Johns Hopkins, and Columbia Universities, as well as the Air War College. He served nine years active duty in the Air Force as a pilot. He completed 30-plus years of military service as a member of the Air National Guard, retiring in 2006 as a Brigadier General. Um, his career at NSA began in 1986 in its information security area, the quaint term that we now often think of as cybersecurity and, or information assurance. Uh, his positions later included senior roles in the signals, operation, uh, signals intelligence operations of NSA. Uh, those included stints as the Special U.S. Liaison Officer London, where he oversaw the uh, NSA partnership with the United Kingdom from 2003 to 2006, very critical time working with the uh, Brits on uh, many of our uh, uh, fights against uh, terrorism. Uh, his time at NSA culminated as deputy director, uh, where he served for seven and a half years, 2006 to 14, uh, the second longest tenure of anybody uh, as deputy director uh, at NSA. It's going to take a lot to beat the guy with the longest tenure, a guy named Tordello. Go look him up. Uh, academically, uh, Chris has served in positions at the U.S. Naval Academy, both early in his career and most recently as their professor of cybersecurity studies. And he also did a stint at the U.S. Military Academy in the uh, early 1990s. Before his current assignment, he served on the U.S. Cyber Solarium Commission, uh, one recommendation of which was the creation of this position. He served on several other government advisory boards, as well as some corporate boards. Um, welcome, Chris. Uh, Michael, go ahead and take it away. Great, Larry. Thank you very much. Um, Mark, thank you, too. Um, Chris, it's Fantastic to see you. Um, it's great to have you here tonight. Um, people should know that our uh, 10 years as deputy directors overlapped and um, I could not have had a better partner um, at NSA than, uh, than you. So uh, great to see you and a uh, lot to talk about tonight, but welcome. Pleasure to be here. Thanks very much for your hospitality. Um, so we're gonna we're gonna dig right in, Chris, and I want to start with um, the cyber threat facing the nation. Um, you've said publicly that, and I want to quote here: "The threat is greater than I can ever remember." And I'm wondering what led you to say that. I'm wondering what the context around that is. You know, is it because we're more vulnerable? Is it because the number of adversaries are growing? Is it because they're getting more sophisticated? Um, is it because they're getting more aggressive? Is it all of that stuff or is it something else? You know, what does the threat landscape look like to you? Yeah, in a phrase, it's all of that. Uh, I think we first begin with what is our dependence on what we most of us think of as the internet, what I describe as digital infrastructure. Uh, we have a massive dependence, whether it's for our the conduct of our personal lives, our business lives, our national security, um, everything we do is fundamentally dependent upon that to include a broad range of critical functions, critical to health and safety of life. Um, second, um, having created that dependence over many, many years, um, transgressors, whether they're criminals or geopolitical foes, have realized that dependence and they're increasingly using that to hold us at risk. And, and in recent years, and I think that there was an inflection point in about 2017, what we've seen is that those transgressors, criminals to nation states, um, they're uh, brazen across anybody's definition of a red line. Um, they're indiscriminate. You don't need to be the target to be the victim. And they're impactful, um, having borderline existential effects on the conduct of national security functions, critical functions, and the conduct of our daily lives. 
Um, we're not resilient and robust against that. We don't have the basic resilience and robustness in technology, people, or for that matter, doctrine, who is accountable for what, such that we can simply look the other way and assume that they simply can't hurt us. Um, we don't actually defend these systems as a collaborative endeavor such that they have to beat all of us to beat one of us. They can pick us off one at a time. Um, and we really don't have a good range of remedies to align actions to consequences. Um, so in all of those facets, we're falling further behind. It's not to say we don't have some very talented people and we don't have some really great technology, um, but we're not really joined up to solve this problem in a way that's required. Um, and a premise in the job that I have is we need to rethink how do we actually make it such that if you're a transgressor, you've got to be all of us to be one of us. We have not done that to date and therefore we're falling further behind. Um, are ransomware attacks the biggest chunk of the attacks that we see? I think they're the most notorious to be sure. Um, I'm not sure that I could say with confidence that in quantity, they're most the most norm numerous, um, but they are a symptom of the larger problem, uh, which is the ecosystem within which they operate um, essentially has low cost of entry, um, a series, a set of tra transgressors, criminals in most cases, but some nation states um, who can syndicate, who can collaborate um, to find someone who might find a weakness in a system of interest, someone that they could sell that to who would then prosecute that entry into that system, someone who might then take over, it's a business, who might then take over to actually effect the actual extortion. Uh, they ask for resources to essentially exfiltrate that ill-gotten gain in the form of cryptocurrency, which is hard to track. Many of them operate in safe havens in the Russia near abroad or other places where it's hard for the reach of law to find them. Um, and they operate against assets that are at once valuable and poorly defended. Um, those assets are information that companies find essential to the conduct of their business or which they kind of hold as information on behalf of others that is personally identifiable information and or health related information um, for which they would pay a pretty premium in order to get that back without some further disclosure. It's a perfect storm, long in the making. Um, we're not gonna turn that around in a fortnight, but given that I've described a systemic set of weaknesses, the way to address that is to take each of those systemic flaws on and, and address them one at a time, but in, in collaboration. Chris, I wanted to mention that, that we've learned of at least one tragic instance where a human life and infants was perhaps lost as a result of a ransomware attack in 2019 in a hospital in Alabama. And I know you probably can't comment on the particular case because there's a lawsuit underway uh, regarding, re regarding the care of the infant. But what I want to ask you is that ransomware attacks aren't just about money, right? I mean, there's human lives at risk here. Is that a fair statement? That's a very fair statement. I think there's another incident that I think is in the public record in Germany um, where a patient attempted to enter into a hospital. Hospital was down because of a, a cyber attack. Um, that hospital diverted that patient to another hospital that could properly service them, could coordinate the arrangement of a room and a doctor, and the patient died en route. And, and so you know, that, that is something that I think you could say is directly attributable to a cyber attack. Um, there are untold numbers of deferred appointments because health systems weren't able to efficiently and effectively schedule um, the um, activities that were required um, that you really can't say how far this problem has gone, but it is not an attack on data or systems or simply an attack on the critical functions that rely on those. It's an attack on health, safety, and confidence that relies on all of the above. Um, Chris, you mentioned Russia as being a place where... Um organized crime is able to conduct ransomware attacks. Um, you testified yesterday that we've not seen yet a decline in attacks originating from Russia um, since uh, President Biden pressed uh, President Putin on this very issue um, at the summit in Geneva. Um, is, is, is China another place where organized crime uh, is able to conduct ransomware attacks or not? Um, it is another place where we see a certain permissiveness in terms of um, the state, not so much looking the other way, but being tolerant of uh, the criminals who are given harbor there. And so long as they don't annoy or impose some friction or harm 
on the local economy or the local government, um, the government tolerates them. As to whether there's a formal connection, a direct connection between the activities of these individuals and a government that would sponsor them or aim them at geopolitical foes, the United States being perhaps a case in point, hard to tell. But we lack actually quite a lot of information about the, um, the rate of incidents, the seriousness of those incidents, because we don't have a universal reporting mechanism within the United States or many other countries that would say, do we really know the scope of what's happening um, kind of in this midst, mist and smoke that, that covers this battlefield? Chris, do you have a sense of why the Russians and the Chinese and perhaps others um, don't crack down? Um, is it because there are political relationships or security relationships or they just want to do damage to the United States? Uh, what's your sense for why they allow this to go on and don't crack down? So, so again, without re re revealing or kind of reverting sure. to classified sure. sources, let, let me imagine what some of those possibilities are. I think it's a set, it's a range of possibilities. Um, one, they may not be specifically aware that these are happening. They don't actually govern um, the population the way we might in terms of ensuring that um, the various actions um, that kind of harass or kind of bother others, we look into, we pursue, we kind of investigate, and when necessary, we will kind of bring that person to justice. The rule of law is not the same in these places, too. Um, the there might be a relationship between the local leadership and these criminals such that there is a profitable arrangement of, um, we'll look the other way so long as you give us a cut of the proceedings and so long as you do not attack right the hand that you're actually kind of being guarded by here. And there might, in some cases, and I have to imagine that this is true in some cases, an illicit or perhaps an explicit but not seen relationship between the government and these criminals such that they can be an artifact of harassment or competition by that nation state against this nation state. I think the Russians under the Durasimov doctrine, again, this is very hypothetical, but the Russians under the Durasimov doctrine have made it clear that there's no such thing as peace or war. There's just competition. It's all on all the time. And any mechanism that you can bring to bear, whether that's propaganda or, or harassment below the use of force, um, is fair game. And, and they, in many cases, have asserted that they believe we do the same thing. We do not. Um, but, but their belief perhaps motivates and fuels you know, their use of these assets um, in ways that we find um, somewhere between interesting and befuddling because we do not have mercenaries in this country who operate on behalf of the government without some very direct kind of contractual relationship such that the government bears the burden of actions taken. Chris Rob Joyce, um, who uh, uh, is the director of the cybersecurity director at NSA and who you know well, um, said, said recently uh, publicly that almost every nation in the world has a cyber exploitation program, um, but that more countries are starting to move beyond just uh, cyber intelligence. And it got me thinking about you, you know, how you think about international norms here. You know, what's acceptable in cyberspace and what's not, right? Is intelligence collection for national security purposes acceptable? Um, ransomware not, um, IP theft not. How do you think about that? Yeah, so um, I, I agree with Rob's perspective on that, um, both you know, what he observed and what he describes as a trend, uh, but would say that the first observation is, is shouldn't be terribly surprising. Uh, most nations have militaries that are armed right, with various weaponry that can, do, um, it can impose violence on others. Um, but the issue isn't whether you have that for legitimate defensive purposes, but rather how you employ that. Um, so Rob's further observation that many of these capabilities that can surveil or what we might describe in colloquial terms as hack on the internet, many of these are being turned to impose consequences or to do damage just Classically, the term of art would be degrade, disrupt, or damage um, something on the internet, or more importantly, something that's dependent on that data or those systems, or the confidence that's dependent upon that. Um, so number, some number of nations are, in fact, crossing that line. Um, you've asked about norms. Um, they're actually very solidly defined norms um, that the United States subscribes to. The Global Group of Experts, sponsored by the United Nations in 2015, came up with a set of norms. They don't have the force of a treaty or a convention, 
but they generally have been um, looked at as um, the reasonable, rational foundation for the expectation one nation should have of another. Um, and, and they wouldn't surprise, I think, anyone on this, uh, this forum. I think typically we would say that no nation has the right in peacetime to hold another nation at risk by holding their critical infrastructure at risk. Therefore, cyber should not be used to hold that critical infrastructure at risk. Any nation seeking the support of another nation in a moment of extremis um, should expect the support of that nation um, and, and so on and so forth. They're generally very sensible arrangements. Um, they leave off the table the possibility that surveillance using these cyber means may or may not be an appropriate activity to undertake. That would lead us to conclude, um, and I'll kind of stand in the role of an academic here, that there are circumstances under which that is appropriate. That can be a stabilizing factor knowing something about the aspirations, expectations, activities of a potential competitor or aggressor allows you to prevent those misunderstandings, prevent crises and conflict. And, and traditionally for millennia, but, but at least the life that I've led, um, we can see that espionage can, when used in proportional ways, be a thoughtful addition to the interaction of, of nations. Um, and so we have to distinguish between the deny of the great disrupt and the use of this to simply understand what's happening in that network of networks. Yeah. Chris, let's um, switch to your job. You're the nation's first national cyber director. Um, what are your responsibilities? What are Congress and what is the president holding you accountable for? Yeah, so if you read the law that created this position, um, you know, it, it would look like this is yet another power entered into the space, an already crowded space, another role to coordinate, drive, lead, perhaps in a czar-like fashion, um, call the shots of who does what. Um, we're not interpreting it that way. Um, what we're doing is to say that there are actually quite a lot of capable players and kind of capabilities, right? Whether that's technology um, or expertise in the, in the form of people, there are already quite a lot of that in space. What's missing is coherence and context um, and perhaps some complementary action. And so my job principally is to ensure that we are joined up, that the sum of the parts is greater than the arithmetic sum, that the various roles and responsibilities complement one another. One case in point um, is that there are within the US system um, kind of what are called sector risk management agencies that have the responsibility from the federal government to have a relationship with a critical sector. So the Department of Energy has a relationship with the energy sector for purposes of peace and tranquility, helping them understand best practices, make themselves resilient and robust, and in a contingency or crisis, be a principal source of support from the government. There are 16 of those for 16 critical sectors. At the same time, um, the Department of Homeland Security has an organization known as the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency which is the on the field quarterback operationally responsible for ensuring that all of that done is, is done in a coherent fashion. My job as the coach, that's the term we use, is to ensure that that's the way it's established, that everyone understands their roles, that those roles are complementary, And when we execute those roles, that they in fact are coherent and you don't need a PhD in government to understand who is gonna do what under what circumstances. I have roles that descend from that of driving public private collaboration, of doing performance assessments, of actually driving future resilience, because today is mostly about response. We need to get to a point where we're actually preventing these incidents, getting left of event, as it were. All of that adds up to a responsibility I have to make the system better, more coherent, make the performance more efficient and effective, but not to introduce yet another power that's hierarchical in nature into the system. So, so Senator King, who was um, one of the leaders of the Solarian Commission on which you served, um, said that uh, the national cyber director role um, was at least in part recommended so that there would be, he said, one throat to choke. Um, and I'm wondering if you felt any of that pressure since, since you've taken this job. Uh, well, of course I have. Um, so I was on the Hill just yesterday for a three hour kind of hearing. And there is an expectation, especially when one looks at the organization chart, the static picture of all of the pieces that are in this space. Natural question is who, who on earth is in charge of that? That's a quite natural, quite reasonable question. It turns out it's not that simple. 
Um, turns out that when the video gets started, when those begin to operate, much like it is in the physical world, there are kind of lines of effort that are not so much independent of one another, but they don't actually have a hierarchical relationship. They have a horizontal relationship, right? We know what individual police forces do to defend, right? They're, they're kind of part of the situation in the physical world. We know what militias do in the National Guard to help us in times of crisis, whether that's a, a natural disaster or some civil crisis. We know what the US military does. We know what all of those parties do and they're concurrent without having a single battle captain that stands at the top of some hierarchy. So I think the right question to ask of this very complicated domain is, do we know who's accountable for what, under what circumstances and for what purposes? My job is to make sure that we have an answer to each of those lines of effort. And so if you ask who is the on the field quarterback that synthesizes everything the government knows and pushes that back out to the largest possible set of beneficiaries, that's CISA. And my job is to make sure that they're set up to succeed in that. Do we know who deals with the energy sector in times of peace and tranquility or in the rise to some contingency or crisis? That's the Department of Energy. My job is to make sure they're set up for that and that those two complement one another. There's, of course, a lot more threads um, on that, that map, but, but my job is to make sure that all of that works um, and that the system is performing um, in an optimal fashion. Chris, you know that some of the commentary about your position is that um, you don't have the authorities, right, that you need to uh, ensure that you meet your responsibilities. How do you think about that critique? Um, that there, there's some truth to that. If, if what you're thinking about is a hierarchical set of authorities where you can direct drive things, um, even to the point of micromanagement, uh, the law is written in many regards um, with, with a view to, to this is really about coordination, this is about establishing relationships and then allowing those to execute with some degree of accountability be delegated. Uh, the law even begins by saying upon direction of the president, giving the president further authority right, to determine how else he or she would want to um, assign that power. Um, case in point, um, within the scope of my job, I really am inside cyberspace, ensuring that all the assets that live inside cyberspace are properly prepared, properly assigned, are complementary, and that we execute. But if you're operating outside of cyberspace to try to bring conditions of some sort about inside cyberspace, let's say you're using military powers or diplomatic powers or intelligence powers, a broad range of traditional instruments of national power, that is traditionally the role of the National Security Council. And that is not mine to drive. I'm at that table. I inform that. I'm heavily inform that. But that's in someone else's hands. That's just the way we as a government have almost always kind of conducted our affairs. We want to achieve conditions inside a domain by using other instruments that are outside that domain. National Security Council adjudicates and drives that. Um, so I, I'm the same in that regard is that I'm in the lane of cyber trying to make sure that as an instrument of power, not the only instrument of power, affected by other instruments of power, I'm doing my part in that lane. So Chris, um, the building of your office. Um, so the infrastructure bill gave you um, $21 million, I think, for your office. Um, you've talked about growing your staff to 75 folks. Um, where are you now um, in terms of people? And what are you looking for? in terms of your staff and where are you, where are you finding them? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I'm gonna expand that question just a little bit so that, so that the context is clear. So this position was created in January. It was authorized in January. There wasn't an appropriation in January. It was nominated, confirmed and showed up for work in July, but the appropriations to essentially fund the positions required and the facilities and the materiel um, those appropriations weren't made until Monday of this week, the week that we're in, so like two days ago. Um, so what we've done between July and now, um, and, and actually there's a silver lining in this, is we've had to work hard to figure out that we don't have the resources ourselves to hire 75, 80 people. How do we then work with and through others to get the resources, loan-ins, right? What we're called non-reimbursable detailees, to create a sufficiently um, robust set of team players here um, that can begin to coordinate, begin to champion, begin to create the connected tissue 
that will give additional leverage to the discrete parts that are out there. So I've got 18 people at the moment. All are essentially non-reimbursable detailees, loan-ins from other organizations. And they come from across the gamut of the federal kind of ecosystem, uh, from the intelligence community, from the Department of Energy, Department of Homeland Security, Department of Defense, and so on and so forth. Um, it's an impressive group of people with significant experience under their belts, so much so that walking the hall sometime, somebody will say, I recently met fill in the blank, somebody from your organization, and they ask, they ask me, are you with them? Right? It's, it's the other person that carries the reputation. That's cool. That's really good. I love being in an organization where, where the talent exceeds your own ability to perhaps kind of script something from the top down. Uh, but now that we do have the money, um, we're kind of in the breakout moment. We have defined the outcomes that we're accountable for. We've built relationships. Um, some of those relationships would be very key so, for example, the Office of Management and Budget, which traditionally has policy and resourcing authority in this space, cyberspace, um, their chief information security officer for the entire federal government has been appointed um, by mutual agreement between me and the director of OMB as my deputy for federal cybersecurity. So we're harmonizing and aligning those roles and responsibilities. But now that we have the resources, the $21 million dollars, We'll find the space necessary to conduct these activities. We'll then begin to hire the people to the tune of 75 or 80 that can build out four broad lines of effort, which I kind of described earlier. I'd be happy to go into details on that. Um, Chris, do you see yourself as putting together a national cyber strategy or not? Or how do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think there should be a national cyber strategy. Um, and I like the term, that, the way you've described that. Um, neither, neither kind of with a defensive mindset alone or an offensive mindset alone, but just what are the aspirations this nation has that we want to achieve in and through cyberspace? It is necessarily um, a derivative of a national security strategy. So what is it this nation wants to achieve? What things do we hold near and dear? What do we want to perhaps achieve in terms of our own initiative? That is currently being worked through by the National Security Council, the interagency process comes to bear on that. Once that's done, then there'll be a derivative out of that since cyber is an instrument of power and it's a domain of interest that would then be able to say, so what's cyber's role in that? And, and what do we need to do with all instruments of power to ensure that we bring those conditions about in cyberspace? Um, I think there will be not a standalone, but perhaps kind of an appendix that says, here's the cyber play, here's the cyber part but it has to be part of the whole. I'm then asked, so if you have a cyber strategy, will you have a cybersecurity strategy or a federal cybersecurity strategy or a Eisenhower building cyber strategy? Mm -hmm. um, all of those things can be inferred, but it gets dangerous to kind of call them out and create stovepipes of, of those things in and of themselves. So I think at the moment, we're kind of trying to make sure that we stay holistic in that description. And, and your office will put that together, take the lead on that and I guess there'll be a classified version and also an unclassified version for the public? Yeah, so uh, back to the conversation. The answer is um, we'll have a heavy influence on that, but given that the cyber strategy will depend upon the application of all instruments of power to achieve the conditions mm -hmm. we desire in cyberspace, and that cyber can affect all instruments of power, all domains of interest, um, I'm a significant player in that. I don't mean to over or understate my role, I'm not the only player in that. And ultimately the National Security Council will determine, do we have the right strategy? I think we've left behind the idea that cyber is a domain unto itself, that it's independent of the other domains of interest that we can somehow determine in a purely symmetric way that what happens in cyberspace should be responded to by cyberspace. That's not true, especially when you have the safe havens that we're kind of encountering that require the application of other instruments of power legal remedies, financial remedies, diplomatic remedies. So, um, Chris, you, you've said publicly that a strategy that is overly reliant on indictments and other actions by, say, the Justice Department doesn't do a lot to affect the psychology of hackers who are sitting in, say, Russia. Um, so how do you... How do you think about the um, United States actually deterring those folks? Um, how do we do that? Um, yeah, that that's, that's a great question. That seems an and important part of the strategy going forward. Yeah, I wish we had six hours to talk about it. <laughs> First, I think that, um, that, that 
I'm confident that this administration and previous administrations, but this one, um, believes that cyber deterrence is possible. But, but we have to hedge our expectations. It's not the same thing as what we experienced in, in the realm of nuclear deterrence, where the game was we needed to keep the weapon off the field. It was an offense dominant error uh, era such that when a nuclear weapon showed up, it was game over, you'd lost, right? You know, you, you abject failure. Um, the cost of entry is too low, um, such that in cyber, this is an offense persistent domain. But the game remains the same, which is cyber has, or deterrence has always been focused on changing the decision calculus of a transgressor, not on some absolute sense of whether you can keep the weapon off the field or not. You know, that's unique to one domain. It's not kind of gonna work in this one. And, and where does the change of decision calculus come from? Uh, several places. Um, one is you need to convince them that it's simply not worth the cost. You become a harder target. So deterrence by denial actually has a play in this space. Um, actually 80, 90% of what's happened in ransomware is attributable to simple human errors. You can go back through the most notorious events of this year. And in each case you say, but for this very simple kind of single threaded vulnerability that was traceable to a human action, it wouldn't have happened. It's not to say that the transgressors wouldn't up their game and try and find another way. They would, of course. But we can get rid of a lot of this just by deterrence, by denial, um, complemented by a very proactive defense, meaning the systems can't be made secure. At best, they're defensible. We need to actually defend them. And to my earlier point, you need to defend those in a collaborative manner because they can beat us one at a time if we use only those things we know in our respective stovepipes. But if we combine our insights, our authority capabilities, we're a tougher bunch to beat. Um, and then finally, you do need to impose consequences on those that continue to come at, harass, or succeed against you um, so that denial by or deterrence by cost of position, that's a real and material factor. Um, of course, classic deterrence theory says that there's also the role for norm setting. We've done that. And there's also a role for entanglement meaning that let's kind of come up with a like-minded group of nations that creates a bulwark against the kind of folks who would transgress. And let's make sure that to the extent necessary, we entangle ourselves with those transgressors so that they at least understand what we believe is appropriate or inappropriate behavior. And they're more likely if we have some shared activities, we might not agree on everything, but they're more likely if we have some shared activities and not want to hold common interests at risk. That's of course a complicated formulation but it's the sum of all those things that I think creates a change in the decision calculus of a potential transgressor. And I think if we were to give more time and attention to that, we would make um, a discernible impact on, on, the, on the level of threat that we're experiencing. Yeah, Chris, you mentioned a key part of that is, is, is us defending our systems. Um, and I'm wondering how you think about what's standing in the way of that, right? What's standing in the way of people applying the technology they need to apply and undertaking the behaviors um, they need to um, uh, have? Um, why is this so hard in terms of defending these systems? Uh, yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, I don't wanna steal thunder from a question you might ask me later, what keeps me awake at night? But, but it's in this category. Uh, which is what really keeps me awake at night is not kind of the, the nature of threat that's constituted in the form of either criminals or nation states. It, what keeps me awake at night is our proactive ambivalence. And by that, I mean um, that we're generally aware as a society that something is amiss, right? You know, you can't miss this. You can't, you can't stand there and watch the news reports and, and believe that nothing is amiss. Where the proactive ambivalence comes in is we all believe it's somebody else's problem. This is not my problem to solve, right? And so we variously point to the folks that have cyber or IT in their names and say, you need to hold me safe from mistakes or risks that I take, right? That's simply not a tenable proposition. Or right. we believe that individuals can't make a dent on this, that organizations, small to medium-sized organizations can't make a dent on this, that only the champions of you know, sufficient heft and size can, or worse, that we can shoot our way out of this, that it's simply a game of, if somebody does A to us, then tit for tat, we're gonna do B back to them. All of that I think is in the realm of we simply don't understand the problem as it is. And we sometimes refuse to acknowledge it for what it is. And I worry about the latter of those more than anything else. Yeah, yeah. Um, Chris, I'd love to get your 
take a bit on what you see as the proper relationship between the government and the private sector here. Um, obviously, that's important. And for context, let me just tell the audience something I'm sure you know that in a recent accounting of the response to the solar winds incursion, the president of Microsoft, Brad Smith, um, actually wrote, and I quote, it's impossible to avoid the grave conclusion that the sharing of cybersecurity threat intelligence today is even more challenged than it was for terrorist threat information before 9-11. So there's you know, some pretty strong views out there. So how do you see this? Um, what do you think it should look like and um, how do we get there? Yeah, so that was a comment made circa late 2020. I agree, contemporaneously, I agree. Um, I, so let's go back to 9-11 and use that perhaps um, as an analogy. Uh, you and I remember quite clearly that two things that we kind of thought we learned in the immediate aftermath of 9-11 was, and I quote General Hayden here, that Garrison was not sanctuary, right? That we were held at risk in our kind of our homeland. Um, that's true times 10 in cyberspace. And the second thing I can remo remember thinking that we learned in the immediate aftermath was we had failed to connect the dots. That actually in the long arc of our experience, that wasn't really the problem. The problem was we had failed to put our various hunches and insights, shards and shreds of information together in a way that we could form the dots, that, that we could learn something together by combining these authorities in an appropriate and lawful way to discover something that no one institution could discover alone. That's true in cyberspace times 100. And, and so when kind of various parties, whether it's the person you refer to, other CEOs say, it's really hard right, to kind of share information, that's only half the problem, right? Sharing information is one thing, but, but creating insights in a collaborative fashion that no, no one could find alone, that's another thing. And that's where I think we're really falling short. Um, so you and I well know the nature of what's called the special relationship between the U.S. and the U.K. And the real secret sauce there um, isn't the degree of which, of, of, of which sharing will kind of do for exquisite, finely kind of tailored reports. The real magic there is that we collaborate at the lowest possible level to share insights and partial kind of understanding so that we together form kind of analyses that neither one of us could form alone. I'm not giving away the, kind of the secret here. That's actually the magic, the miracle of that. So what we're proposing that we do differently to address the concern that you've raised is how do we actually reverse the model for collaboration, which used to be um, information itself is a form of collaboration. It's not, information doesn't collaborate. Or that we'll kind of find something that we think is so exquisitely valuable that of course it's probably gonna be classified or proprietary that will then work to try to figure out how to sanitize and push it across to the other party. At that point, it's sufficiently denuded of any valuable content or timely um, kind of timeliness that it's typically not worthwhile. That's what people were reflecting on in 2020. Um, let's actually figure out how to get together to co-discover, co-mitigate threats that we can only find by saying we need to form dots together. It's not a notional aspiration. Our British counterparts, our Israeli counterparts have both done this. Um, they have different names for those activities than we might assign to them, but they've essentially put private and public sector experts together on a common floor plate, um, and they've, they've achieved a demonstrable success um, in trying to figure out what can we discover together for the benefit of all of us, right? So the transgressor needs to fool all of us to get past one of us, or more importantly, to beat all of us to beat one of us. So Chris, when, when you step away from this job in two years, four years, eight years, you know, whenever it is, right? Um, what will, what would success look like um, as the nation's first national cyber director? I can think of three things at the moment. Um, one, that this organization was known um, and, and quantitatively could, could be assessed as having added value to the ecosystem, the private sector, public sector ecosystem combined, right? That, that the parts were more effective, that they had greater leverage, greater context. Um, with respect to their ability to make the difference that they should. Um, two, that we had established um, a culture within the federal government um, that while it does need to ensure that it regulates and ensures the delivery of critical functions and other activities, 
um, consistent with law and the expectations of customers, that more often than not, what it did was to proactively generate capacity, insights, capability before the event to aid and abet the kind of improvement of the resilience and robustness of the system and the creation of conditions that essentially got us left of the event. Um, and then finally, third, um, is that we in the community of nations um, increasingly saw this as an international um, kind of challenge, not a national challenge alone, that, that we saw that the largest possible context is the most appropriate and most impactful context, which is that we do this among like-minded nations. Chris, that's great, thank you. Let's um, go to some questions here from the audience. Um, let me scroll through them here. There's a lot of them. Um, uh, so the first one is from a long time intelligence officer and I'm sure you've seen this question in the press as well. And the question is, what's the relationship between your office, and you spoke about this a little bit, and Ann Newberg's office at the NSC? Yeah, uh, I, I think it's, um, it's at once straightforward and you know, complicated for those that want a hierarchical single czar. Um, I'm not a czar. Um, my job is to ensure that inside cyberspace, using the assets that we enjoy inside cyberspace, typically the assets in the, ha in the hands of chief information security officers or kind of the IT and cyber specialist, that we're prepared to create resilience and robustness, that we, with unity of effort, unity of purpose, kind of deliver resilience and robustness, and we defend with unity of effort, unity of purpose, um, both on federal estates and in our support to the private sector, which manages the critical infrastructure. Anne's job is to ensure that to create those conditions or sustain those conditions through the use of instruments outside of cyberspace, military, intelligence, diplomacy. Anne's job, the National Security Council's job, is to make sure that those instruments are doing their, their, their part, their work, Right, to deliver the conditions inside cyberspace. But why is that appropriate to put in the hands of Anne as opposed to me? Those instruments actually deliver other conditions. Right? They achieve other, other, for other purposes, we need to make sure that there's some degree of coherence in the application of any one of those non-cyber instruments for the broad array of purposes that our national security strategy, not our national cyber strategy, but the bigger national security strategy would call for. Um, we're supposed to complement one another. That's the work before us. We do that. We talk to each other on a frequent basis. We make sure that um, the success of one is the responsibility of both of them. Right? And so I think that's how we need to proceed. Um, a question um, uh, that says the, the, the Solarium Commission recommendations include an incremental scale of retaliation measures um, moving you know, to, to even the kinetic, um, which is obviously a presidential decision, right? At the end of the day, um, you and I know that. Um, the question here is, do you think our closest international partners um, would be willing to go that far or not? I know that's a tough question. I mean, short of kinetic um, activity that would um, perhaps be um, incongruent with responding to a cyber activity. I know you earlier made the point thoughtfully, appropriately that, cyber can sometimes lead to effects in the physical world, but, but let's take that one off the table for the moment. Um, you know, I think that the appropriate response to activities in cyberspace should be necessary and proportional. It's a European term. We don't typically use that, that, that terminology, but, but we kind of play by the same rules. And so we just need to make sure, and I think the Solarium Commission was arguing um, that we need to be thoughtful, and surgical, and pointed and use all instruments of power at our disposal. Um, and we need to make sure that at some point we change the decision calculus of adversaries. So that's the kind of sense that you need to ratchet it up if you find that you're not having the desired effect. There is a moment in time when we realize that what we're doing is either sufficiently um, non-traditional, that there's a consultation required, not simply amongst our interagency process, but with allies who live in the same shared space, or that we cross a threshold we might describe as the use of force or kind of holding things at risk that our norms say that we should critical infrastructure is one of those. Um, so it's a complicated um, calculus, but, but the decision points are really reasonably clearly defined. Here's an interesting question, um, Chris. Um, somebody noted the, the recent 
infrastructure bill, including um, you know, significant funding for broadband across the country. Um, and the question is, um, is, are there funds there? Are there plans there to make sure that we mitigate the cyber risks associated with the new infrastructure? There are, there are. I think there's $20 billion in funds that could reasonably be described in this bill as having a cyber purpose or a cyber um, kind of nexus. Um, but all of that money needs to be kind of committed in a way that the systems we build are cyber aware. Uh, meaning that resilience robustness is built in. And some of that money is expressly for the purposes of improving cyber um, specifically. There are some funds in it that would essentially be um, to, to support shared services or emergency services to state, local, or other entities that find themselves in a moment of extremis in need of federal support. So CISA or the Department of Homeland Security would exercise those funds. So across the range of resilience to response to recovery, there is money identified in that, but all of it needs to be spent such that it does not increase our cyber threat, but rather decreases it because it's built in. And here's another great question. So for those, for those students um, who are in the audience um, and those students who might have an interest in spending a career, um, you know, thinking about working cybersecurity, um, what should they study? Um, what kind of, uh, what kind of internship should they have? Um, and I know, you know, you know, it's a very broad um, spectrum of, of jobs in this area, but maybe narrow it down to what if they want to be on the staff someday of the National Cyber Director? Um, yes, yeah, so that's, a, that's a great question. So let, let me take off some misconceptions, which is that cyber is a technology um, kind of discipline alone. Uh, of course, technology is often the pacing function some broad understanding of how technology works and what your expectations should be of it, what its limitations, that's important. But you don't need to be a master of science in computer science or computer engineering or electrical engineering to have a significant role in cyber. That's why I describe cyber the now as the sum of technology and people and doctrine, roles and responsibilities. And, and our adversaries actually attack them in reverse order. And so if you're a solid critical thinker, you actually have a systems orientation. You like to think your way through systems and bring solutions to systems, systems of discipline, systems of people, systems of system. If you think that way, you're tailor-made for cyber. And if you want to do something that matters, I can't think of anything at the moment that matters more. Um, and all of that, technology, people, and doctrine, it's, it's cyber because it's cyber as opposed to computer science because it's done, it's practiced in the presence of an adversary. So some knowledge of geopolitics and what makes the world tick is also useful. So what I'm looking for in this office, um, are you a good, solid, critical thinker? Do you have a public service mentality? Do you want to kind of stand in and make a difference to something else other than you know, perhaps your, your own status? And fortunate not to say that we don't help people develop and progress in ways that they are then more capable and therefore more employable when it's all said and done. But there's a very strong public service kind of mindset here which I know exists broadly across the population that shows up for events like this. If that's you, you're a systems thinker, you're a critical thinker, you're already halfway there. Um, there's a question, Chris, from um, one of your former um, colleagues at NSA. Um, and the question is, is designing collaboration um, with foreign partners part of your remit? And are there foreign counterparts to your position? Well, there are foreign counterparts. They at least have the same job title, but you know, kind of the, the label means less than actually you know, what they do when it comes off the picture and starts to become the video. But I met just today with um, two counterparts from foreign nations. They wouldn't surprise you. Um, I probably meet once or twice a week with them. And so there are very strong connected um, kind of elements between what I do and what others do. That being said, um, so our State Department has recently created a position that will become the cyber ambassador in a, in a corollary or another position that will have significant responsibility for dealing with other nations on emerging technology. And Neuberger, of course, as a member of the National Security Council, deals with other nations. So the three of us, and possibly every discrete element within our government, we have foreign relationships. What I think they look to me for, foreign nations look to me for, is how do we describe within our own system federal coherence? How are we aligning and making complementary the entities that deal directly with critical sector and those that are responsible for the synthesis and perhaps the coordination of that? 
and, and what are our objectives in terms of the federal government's support to the private sector. So I think that many want to learn from us. We will learn from them. Um, many want to synchronize with us such that if we have a common threat, and increasingly we do, that we're more likely to find that it's a tongue and groove situation as opposed to their discontinuities at some national boundary. So another question from one of your former um, colleagues, NSA, um, is there now, um, are there any future plans to red team cyber attacks on critical infrastructure? Yes, yes, and yes. It's actually written into the law the National Defense Authorization Act of 2021 that was passed into law this past January. And so the Department of Homeland Security has responsibility for that. If they can, across the federal enterprise, show up on a no-notice basis, and they can, within the critical infrastructure, um, show up on a, on a consensual basis. But, but increasingly, you'll see that that's an important, it's not a substitute for solid resilience and robustness and a comprehensive set of sensors and analytics that understand the totality of the system's performance. But they're a really good tool to understand the, kind of the gravity of, of either the strength or the weakness of a given system. Um, I know there's, there's not a lot you can say on this, but a question about um, um, Cyber Command and uh, what, what it could possibly do um, um, to, to conduct offensive cyber operations for defensive purposes. Um, and somebody's asking about um, the potential collateral damage associated with that. Is that something that um, the president would have to take into account before ordering such an attack? Uh, yes, yeah, I, that, that actually, that's a pretty straightforward question. Um, I'll, I'll answer in two ways. One, I was unfortunately, but accurately quoted a few years ago as saying that if cyberspace were the American game of soccer, the European game of football, um, we'd be 10 minutes into the game and scored before 462 to 450, right? Meaning that just about any offense can succeed against just, a, just about any defense. Um, that is not materially changed when you look broadly across societies. There are some very strong elements. I mean, our financial sector is very strong. Our defense department, very strong on defense. Um, but, but the offenses still have a stunning, significant advantage. That being said, United States Cyber Command lives by the same rules that any other military component does, which is we need to have you know, civilian control of those assets. We need to have an express purpose for which we would apply those assets. And we need to understand what the expected outcomes are. And we need to limit, um, not by um, kind of tracking it and, and apologizing afterwards, but by understanding in advance, you know, what do we expect the, kind of the, the effect to be? What are the effects that we either can't predict or that kind of are sufficiently uncertain that we establish then an envelope within which we say, well, these effects, these collateral effects are acceptable, these are not. And if you can't with sufficient probability guarantee that you'll live within that box, you can't proceed. Mm -hmm. right? So, so the, all of that exists at Cyber Command as much as it exists at any kinetic activity that might exist in traditional militaries. So uh, a similar question about um, CISA as we had on, on Ann Neuberger, how does Jen Easterly and her, her organization fit in with what it is you're, you're doing? Yeah, so, so we've used a term which confounds some of our, uh, our foreign um, allies and friends, which is that Jen is the quarterback and I'm the coach. Um, for those that kind of perhaps don't follow sports either in the United States or outside of it, what we mean by that is that Jen is literally on the field, right? Has the assets required um, to respond, surge, defend um, inside cyberspace. Doesn't have assets outside of cyberspace like the military or diplomacy or intelligence and such. But inside cyberspace, Jen has those assets and is accountable for kind of the on the field coordination of the deployment of assets from the sector risk management agencies, Department of Energy, Department of Defense and others who have direct relationship with critical sectors like energy or kind of the financial sector. But my job as coach is to ensure that their roles are well defined, that they're prepared to execute those roles and that when they do that those roles are complementary. So as coach, I'm not micromanaging those activities on a day to day basis. Um, but I'm, I'm accountable to ensure that those are in fact prepared and executed in a way that meets our expectations, coherent and proactive. It's a question about the public-private partnership and um, is pushing a little bit on that. The question is, cyber is the only battle space where the private sector is expected to largely provide its own defense. Um, 
And the question is, does it make sense to you to pick the most critical of critical infrastructure and have the government more actively involved in the defense? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, it, it, as you pose it, it almost sounds like a softball. I mean, I would say, yes, yes. Um, so, so let me give you an anecdote and see if this is getting close to the, to the nature of the question. This is a true story. 2012, 2013, the Iranian government did denial of service attacks against U.S. financial infrastructure on, I think it was about 200 separate days. Mm -hmm. um, at the time, you know, most observers, all observers said it's something that the private sector can handle. And out of an abundance of respect for the sovereignty of the private sector, which built and operate and essentially defended as the first skirmish line, those assets, the U.S. government chose to not stand it. The U.S. government said they can handle it. Um, it sent all the wrong messages. It sent a message to the Iranians that they can hold our civilian infrastructure at risk with impunity. It sent a message to the banks that you're on your own, right? Despite the fact that the government has some either knowledge or assets, we're not going to strongly deploy this. Of course, the government provided information at the time of we think this is coming your way, but nothing more. I mean, it turned out that the private sector was not as capable in understanding what was happening to them as we might have imagined because they're not authorized to know what happens over the far horizon. They didn't know where this was coming from. They could only see its last point of approach. And they didn't have the full panoply of government instruments of power to include diplomacy or kind of a military activity or intelligence and so on and so forth to essentially bring the full force of what this nation state could bring to bear to challenge another nation state holding us at risk. That's why in 2014, we changed the posture and said that when Sony Pictures was attacked by North Korea, we would stand in, that it was the policy of this government to defend its private sector, even in cyberspace, the time and place of our choosing, some degree of ambiguity there. That's why in 2018, um, we approved um, kind of a publicly now known um, activity, which is we allowed Cyber Command to persistently engage adversaries that we knew were holding us at risk and to forward defend against those adversaries. Now, my view is that we should bring all instruments of power to bear in the same way. We should have early discernment and, and early action for those things that genuinely, legitimately hold us at risk, such that the private sector doesn't need to hold its own against a nation state or an entity that has the capacity of a nation state. The WannaCry and not Petya in 2017 were propagated by North Korea and China, I'm sorry, Russia, respectively. Um, and they had a significant deleterious effect on the private sector. Um, and, and if that goes unchallenged by this nation state, then we send a message to the private sector of you're on your own in an unfair fight. That is not what I think governments owe their people. If that's not the question, I'm happy to go back. Sounds like it to me. Um, so the early discernment um, is an intelligence function at the end of the day. Um, and I'm wondering if the intelligence community, um, and how do I ask this in a way that you can answer it? Um, are they heading in the right direction um, in being able to do that? They are. Um, so the Solarian Commission recommended that um, we make servicing, not the private sector, but servicing the defense, the government's assistance in the defense of the private sector, a formally acknowledged intelligence priority. Um, such that we can get past this idea that unless we have information that we got for some other purpose that has a dual use, right, in informing the private sector, we can't help the private sector understand the threats that are arrayed against it. Um, in no way, shape, or form do we want the U.S. intelligence community doing domestic surveillance. But we do want the U.S. intelligence community mindful of how the government can apply its powers abroad against nation states, understanding the nature of what that threat is against us, and share that actionable information, not simply with the government instrument of powers, but with a private sector that can then meaningfully do something about that. Um, consider what probably happened um, before I got to this job in 2018 and 2020, when the Russian government was attempting to affect the confidence or possibly the conduct of our elections. Uh, most of that impact was felt on private sector entities, whether it's Facebook or Google or other kind of entities that were managing the traffic or managing social kind of interaction, if the government in those days knew that a certain actor um, was operating from a certain location and about to send a certain kind of sequence of either instructions or signatures, 
I believe it had an obligation to share that with the receiving party in the private sector such that they could then properly defend themselves. I believe that they did without having any knowledge of what transpired in the day. Um, there are actually some quite explicit examples where field guides, that's my term, not what was described at the time, but field guides were produced by the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Justice, Department of Defense combined that said, we know these to be Russian transgressors. We know these IP addresses to be associated with them. We know these signatures to be associated with them. And while we're not in a place to essentially look for them in the private infrastructure, we give those to all of the CISOs broadly across the land, for that matter, across the world, such that you now know what to look for, what to, what to kill on site, what not to let into your system. That is hugely helpful. Um, beyond that, the proactive generation of government capacity to hold transgressors of a nation state at risk, I think is quite helpful to the private sector. Somebody noted, um, Chris, that you had mentioned cryptocurrency. Um, and um, boil, boil the question down to, if cryptocurrency didn't exist, um, what kind of dent would that put in ransomware attacks? It would put a dent into it. Um, it wouldn't completely remove it. There'd still be kind of you know, ways to, um, you know, I think criminals for quite a long time have gotten people to kind of come up with Apple pay cards or various other means of kind of you know, transfer of funds. But, but you wouldn't be able to do it at the scope, the scale, and, and with the agility that, that ransomware actors have done. Um, because cryptocurrency by its very nature takes the government out of the equation um, and it's simply a transaction between two private individuals. Um, and so the ability that it then has to be misused, I mean, there's value in that, but the ability it has to be misused to hide your ill-gotten gains um, has been an element that's caused ransomware to explode. But there are other factors that have led to that, but, but ransomware um, kind of depends in, in a large way on these illicit cryptocurrency flows. Um, Larry's going to join us now. Larry? Excellent. So, Chris, I'm going to take a host prerogative here and ask you a question myself. So, it wasn't terribly long ago that you were coming to the Situation Room when I was the director there, attending lots of meetings having to do with revelations that were made by one Mr. Snowden. Uh, revelations that, to a certain segment of the population, uh, presented NSA as a scary proposition. Um, at that time, if someone had said... In 2021, the, the three major players in the U.S. government for cyber, uh, Chris Inglis, Jen Easterly, and uh, Ann Neuberger, are all going to be people with long tenures and pedigrees from NSA. I, I, I think I would have said, I just can't see that happening. So uh, my question is, um, did anything change to make that happen? And um, for that segment of the population that worries about that, what assurances can you give them that uh, they've got nothing to worry about? Yeah, so um, thanks for the question. Um, it's been a while since I've actually kind of talked about that, but, but let me offer the following. Um, first, I wouldn't take anything off the table in terms of um, what concerns an American public should have about the kind of power that's put in the hands of an NSA or a CIA or any institution that can hold legitimate adversaries at risk. Um, Jeffrey Stone, not Oliver Stone, the guy who made the movie, but Jeffrey Stone from the University of Chicago Law School, uh, once wrote a piece about NSA that said, to his surprise, when he looked hard at what NSA was alleged to have done, Snowden had allegations, not revelations. Um, he said, to his surprise, NSA was deserving of the public's trust, but we should never, ever trust NSA. I, I think that's actually quite appropriate. That's the nature of our Constitution which says that we're going to give the government certain powers, but expressly kind of prohibit the government from using any powers that are not explicitly enumerated. And, and anyone that works in the government should sign up for that with a smile on their face and say, I'm so pleased to be able to operate in, in a place where I get authority, but I have to justify that basis of trust action by action. I'm, I'm very good with that. That being said, you've noted that the three players that we've described tonight as having some of the principal roles in this space and Newberger, myself, Jen Easterly, at some point in their careers, transited through a place called the National Security Agency. That's true. Um, but having said that, we're also from a lot of other places at the same time. Um, Jen, over the last four and a half, five years, led the practice of a fairly significant financial concern for cyber defense globally and built and operated a team of 
don't know precisely how many people, but in the thousands um, who essentially did this work on a daily basis in the private sector. Um, Ann Neuberger started her career in the private sector, worked at the White House, um, came to NSA, I would describe mid-career, and is now back at the White House in a senior position. And I myself, while I started my career at, in the Air Force, I was a pilot for a while, meaning I was happy once. I started my career as a pilot. I came to NSA mid-career, left NSA after 28 years, went into the private sector in a variety of capacities. I would say that what that tells me is that we can and should be able to have confidence that NSA will do the right thing. It's never shown itself to intentionally do the wrong thing. Uh, we have mechanisms by which we can hold our public officials accountable, they're appropriate, and that, that experience matters, that experience counts. Um, but the jobs that we're in now, not being at NSA, we're not expected to have a bias or a favoritism for NSA. We're merely going to take that experience as much as we take our private sector experience or academic experience or military experience, all of that, and essentially apply that as best we can. Well, well said, well said. Thank you very much. Uh, Michael, did you have any final thoughts? No, no, I thought this was great. Chris, thank you so much. So, uh, Chris. Uh, can, I, can I take um, kind of the, the speaker's prerogative? I, there's been absolutely. a question at the center of my screen for quite some time. It's a great question. I think this is an important question, which is, has the cyber threat been a so, slow boil of the frog? Or is there a Sputnik moment, or oh, often this is described to me as a Pearl Harbor moment coming that we just ignore? It's a great question. Uh, I think that we're in the former. It's a slow boil of the frog. Uh, I believe that we should not be waiting for a cyber Pearl Harbor or cyber 9-11. It's happening, right? It's, it's just happening with sufficient um, kind of spread, either in the time that it's occurring or the geographic occurrences where it's occurring, that it hasn't registered on us as this single cathartic moment that some group of us have experienced to say, we kind of just went through a tragedy. It's happening well off to the right, well off to the left, things getting picked off one at a time. There's this great Larson cartoon where a bunch of um, penguins are on an ice flow, and in the middle of this ice flow is a polar bear with a penguin face on. Of course, this couldn't happen. They live on different poles, but it's a great cartoon all the same. And one penguin looks at another penguin in this cartoon and says, I tell you, something really strange is going on now. Edgar is missing. Right? I think that's what's happening to us is this insidious threat is dispersed in time and place so that we don't recognize it for what it is. And when we kind of stand back and take a look at it, we're in the slow boil of the frog and absent some absolute indicators, some temperature gradients, we'll miss this by a country mile. That's true of other issues though, isn't it too? Uh, climate change, for example, it's- It is. It is the most dangerous kind of threat. It is, it is. On, on that gloomy note, uh... <laughs> Uh, I, I we, do. we have the power to do something about this, and we can, and we will. So, well, I uh, I want to uh, personally thank you, Chris, for taking the time. I, I think I I think I may have sent you my first email asking you to do this, maybe the day after you got nominated. So, uh, so I appreciate you, uh, you 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 finding the time to do it. Uh, it's been a long day. You're sitting in your office at the uh, Eisenhower Executive Office Building. Uh, I think you've got a significant other waiting uh, to spend some time with. So we won't hold you any longer. Uh, so thank you uh, on behalf of General Hayden also thank you um, for the rest of you uh, in the audience uh, we do have a great event coming up next week Michael Morell on Tuesday will be hosting an event where he'll be discussing with some academic experts on China uh, what the you know what the strategic implications of our relationship are there's been lots of movement in that relationship just in the last few days with the president meeting virtually with uh, his counterpart in China. So I think uh, we've got Graham Allison, <clears throat> legendary um, uh, political scientist. We have Hal Brands, uh, another uh, uh, great uh, thinker. Uh, and then we have our own Shar Schools, uh, Ketian Zhang, who is uh, also uh, someone who has written on China. They all bring different perspectives about the U.S. relation with China and what China is up to. I think uh, uh, I think that should be a great conversation. And the week following that, on December first, we're going to be taking a look at uh, uh, intelligence and COVID. Kind of where do we go from here? What should intelligence be doing? Uh, what shouldn't intelligence be doing in that area? Uh, we are going to have some great folks lined up for that. So be on the lookout on our social media. Uh, for those events, uh, sign up, and uh, we hope to see you there. Uh, over to you, Mark. Great. Thank you, Larry. And Chris Inglis, thank you very much. That was fascinating and quite sobering to 
listen to that discussion. I hope everybody was paying very close attention and we'll spread the word about this presentation since we do have it on video. It's gonna be on our YouTube channel and those who didn't have the benefit of seeing it live can uh, certainly see it later. So uh, thank you to all the attendees. Thank you, Michael Morell for moderating once again. Thank you, Larry, for everything that you're doing and uh, continuing with the Hayden Center programs. Uh, we're going at a fast pace right now with two coming up in the next couple of weeks heading into the holidays. So uh, let's keep it going. And uh, again, my appreciation to all. Have a good night, everybody.